Hey guys, and welcome to a new Nashville Masterclass. I'm your host, James Louisel May, and today we're going to talk about one of the most epic bad trip stories I have. It takes place over four days. Um, since you guys can't seem to finish any of my videos, I'm going to try to chop this up into two of them. I don't blame you who don't want to listen to me for that long. So, me and my friends had just seen uh, Josh Wink and Diesel Boy in Atlanta. And we find out he is um, playing again at a rave in Charlotte, North Carolina with uh, DJ Odie. So, I have some friends uh, that are the same guy that uh, bartended. At Club La Vila, he was now living um, in Delaware, so he was going to meet me there in Charlotte. So I get a bunch of ecstasy tabs and some OC40s. Now, this is in 1999. Why they had been around for a few years, they hadn't exploded yet. It wasn't, not everybody heard of these things. I was brand new to them. So, I get a bus ticket to Charlotte. And I get a return ticket, but that's not what was going to end up happening. I sliced a, a hole in the around the belt loop of my pants and slid the OCs in there. Now, I don't know why I didn't do that with the ecstasy, but I put the OCs in there. I get on the bus. The ride up there wasn't too eventful, except for the fact that as I got into Charlotte, I'm starting to feel really weird. Now, these ecstasy pills, I'm not sure what was wrong with them, whether they were synthesized wrong or if something else was added, but I was not having a good time. It didn't feel like ecstasy. In fact, it seemed the more that I would take, the absolute worse I would feel. And it wasn't the normal, just taking too much ecstasy, not drinking enough water thing. This was something very, very wrong with these pills. But I'm starting to feel bad, so I reached for an OC40, and I realized that on the last bus I was on, they somehow slid out and someone else, who knows, got the surprise of about eight OC40s. Probably didn't know what they were and threw them away. So that's one of the first bad things that happens. So Dan and his friend pick me up and we go to the spot where they're going to have the rave. Now, this was a real honky-tonk place in Charlotte. It was a very weird place to have a party like that. And as I mentioned in my interview, I would have this lanyard with all these VIP things. Uh, you have all the parties I've been to. And I just told them I was from another company, and they let me in, let, let us in. So we're standing around nothing, it hardly seems to be anybody there. Most everybody was in cowboy hats and boots. And we get this idea, well, why do we want to stay around? Because I've never been that far up north before. So they decide that they're going to take me all the way up Philly, stop along the way. So we get back in the car and... We travel into the morning, and I am just getting worse and worse. We're listening to this um, one mix he had in the car, and it was just it was just making my mental state that much worse. We go to D.C., and he's driving me around, showing me to all these places, telling me that's the most haunted restaurant in America, and. And then you drive by the um the stairs that were in um oh what was that one with Linda Blair and the one that my God everybody knows the Exorcist God sakes I'm always forgetting words like that we drive by the stairs and 
It was the first time I'd seen uh, homeless people stand in front of a barrel burning wood, you know, with their hands out like that. We didn't have that down south. And the whole thing was, I was just in this mindset of the history of this place, all the weird, messed up things that had happened, you know, all the really weird, world-changing deals that had gone down in this place. So I'm getting a really bad vibe, just uh, picturing revolutionary soldiers dying on the ground and, and all of these things that happened. So we get to the Smithsonian. And I think it's a grand idea to go in because I've always wanted to go to the Natural History Museum. It was not a good idea. One of the first things I remember seeing was this ancient Roman horse costume that they would wear during plays. Now, this was really from the Roman era. It was tattered. I was, I was just in this mindset, who wore this? What were those people like? How do they live? How do they die? All the eons this, this thing had been around. And then we get to the skeletons of all these ancient extinct creatures. And I'm looking at these bones thinking, this thing used to be alive. It used to be up walking around. It had a whole life. Then I was thinking, what was, what was the first creature that ate another one to survive? This was my mindset. I am seriously freaking out. This was the first time in my life that I'd had such a reaction as this. The DXM had come before, you know, not even a year, but it was a different kind of trip. I was, you know, laid out, hallucinating. Now, this was different. I wasn't hallucinating, but it was just this horrible mindset. So, I'm losing it. I'm in front of the Hope Diamond with my face just pressed up. Again, and people are noticing it. The security guards were definitely noticing it. So, I get yanked out of there. This ain't taking that much time. I'm just going to finish the whole thing. So, we keep traveling into the night to get to Delaware. Uh, Dan is an alcoholic. And he hasn't slept. And I hadn't slept either. Not since I left Birmingham uh, about two days before. And he's falling asleep at the wheel. He's having to stop and pour water over his face. He, he drinks a beer and it just becomes better. We hit Philadelphia. Now, not only am I freaking out from these horrible ecstasy tabs, now I'm in withdrawal. So he says, we can just go to South Street and pick up some dope. Now we hit Philadelphia. Now Philadelphia is unlike anything I've ever seen. I've never been out of the South in my life. It was cold. It was December, and these dudes are out there in short sleeve shirts with the doors to the restaurant and you know shops just open, letting the freezing cold air. These people are used to it. I'm not. And Philadelphia is a is a much older city than anything I've ever been to. And again, like. Uh, DC, I'm thinking of all the just messed up things that has happened here and also all the um, historical figures and people that have lived here. And again, all the things that have happened in the city that's changed the course of the whole world. And I'm completely out of my element. I am sick. I am mentally disturbed, and I don't want this anymore. We could not, not find anybody, anybody to uh, that was selling dope or even look like they would. Um, this is 1999, so we didn't know about Kensington. Uh, I don't think it had really exploded into the type of place it is now. I'm sure, now Dan used to live there, but he hadn't lived there for a year. I'm sure the locals knew about Kensington, but we did not. So we give up. 
we go back to Delaware to his mom's house and I fall asleep for like two or three hours. They got to go to work. I don't know how they did that. But I, I, I threw the towel in. But I don't have that return ticket from Charlotte back home. Now I'm all the way up in Delaware. His mom was not happy about this. She ended up getting me a ticket. Honey. She was really mad. And why wouldn't she be? The whole place around this place in Delaware would just smell like cold, frozen manure. It was out in nowhere. The only town we went to... It's right outside of Philadelphia. Oh, I'll remember it and I'll put it up on the thing later. It's, it's the biggest place in uh, Delaware. But she gets me a ticket back. So she drives me to Dover. And it's just such a small, small little place. And I get on the bus. And we make our way down to Virginia. And we have a stop in Virginia. And I did not read the, uh, the ticket right. I am now starting to hallucinate a little. I haven't slept in days. These, these pills are still in my system. I'm sick. And I messed up reading the thing. And I get stuck at this Greyhound station in Virginia for 10 hours. And I called everybody I could. But... No one could help me. There was really nothing anybody could do. No one was anywhere around me. I had no money. I had nothing. So, I'm wandering around this Greyhound station, trying to watch uh, what little TV they had in there, watching these very strange people walk in and out and it wasn't i wish it had been a place like richmond but it wasn't it was a very small coastal town uh navy base nearby and these people were just look so sad and this is the first time in my life that i am completely on my own in a strange place with nobody I know around, and completely helpless, completely helpless. There's nothing I can do about any of the things that are happening to me. I, I remember I had a surge, if you remember those, and it was one bottle, and I couldn't buy anything else, so I'm just taking little sips every few hours. Finally, the bus comes it goes to Atlanta I don't remember much of the ride back but when I get to Atlanta I realize the next bus to Birmingham doesn't leave for another nine hours and Birmingham's only two two and a half hours at the most it's closer Atlanta's closer to Birmingham than Nashville is so I call up my friend Daniel and I tell him, if he comes and gets me, I'll give him a bunch of ecstasy. And it was... In Atlanta, I saw two or three people get arrested right outside the Greyhound station. It was a lot... There's a lot more activity than, of course, a place in Virginia. I was in a big city, and one that was familiar. So it wasn't as bad. They come and pick me up and drive me back. Of course, I didn't have the ecstasy test. They were all gone. In my head, I didn't even realize that, that, you know, that we had taken them all. I we get back to Birmingham, and I got to face the people that fronted me the tabs. So, all in all, it's been four days. I hadn't slept. And also... When I say I'm going through withdrawal, I had no idea. I did not know I was going through withdrawal at the time. I'd never been through opiate withdrawal. I did not know that that was what, what was wrong with me. This whole trip changed my life and the way I look at things. 
the way I perceive reality was forever changed. I think much more deeply about things. An object is not just an object. I think of where it came from, how it was crafted, uh, you know, just overthinking and overanalyzing everything in my life. And it, it forever changed the person I am. And four days without sleep, on hallucinogenics, and withdrawing from opiates, and going out to places you don't have, you, you don't know and you have no control of where you're going, is a very stupid, stupid idea and something that people, kids, should think about what they're doing. Something that sounds like an adventure may not be the adventure that you're looking for. You know, now, I, I'm sure I do not remember it as bad, I mean, as bad as it was. It's, it was far worse during this time, and there's lots of little nuances I'm not going to go on about that made it much, much worse. I was exposed for the first time the real sadness and sorrow that's in the world. I was sheltered, you know, most of my life, and then I had to be exposed and, and see what it was like for the first time to be completely helpless and out of your element. And unfortunately, all I did was say, well, I'm not going to do that again. But of course, I'd always get myself back into these situations because I always thought this time was different because I changed one or two little things. Uh, I hope you guys enjoy listening to my misfortunes. It's the only way I can really make sense of these things is just by talking about them. Um... Well, I don't have a grand finale other than saying I survived it and I guess I'm that much stronger for it. But really a lot of things in life I look back on and wish I had not done those things. All right, guys. See you next time.